It is viewers like you that make videos like this possible. Please support MickeyMousePark.com. Since the mid-1800s, Coney Island has been America's favorite playground. Amusement parks were carnival-esque places, places where you went to have your sensations stimulated by very, very fast rides, by carnival barkers inviting you in to see Tom Thumb or the giant lady. This place, in its time, both fascinated people and scared them to death. America's favorite playground, the place where the hot dog was invented. The young men like it because it gives them a chance to hug the girls. The girls like it because it gives them a chance to get hugged. I saw this wonderful machine where people are riding on it and taking all kinds of curves, and I saw this as a work of art, like it was a modern, something modern out of a, someone invented this thing. To me, it was a mobile, I felt thrilled by it. It was the nature of going to Coney Island that you would encounter strangeness. You would encounter the unencounterable. It is blatant. It is cheap. It is the apotheosis of the ridiculous. But it is something more. It is like Niagara Falls, or the Grand Canyon, or Yellowstone Park. It is a national playground. And not to have seen it is not to have seen your own country. But Coney Island was more than a playground. The three great amusement parks that flourished there turned the machines of industry into instruments of play and let loose the bright forces and dark possibilities of a vast democratic culture. In 1884, Lamarcus Thompson invented a gravity-powered ride he called a switchback railway. The roller coaster was born. Before long, there were refinements. The loop-the-loop. -the -loop and the flip-flap railway. The flip-flap could take only four passengers at a time, frequently damaged them, and soon went out of business.
In 1893, the 26-year-old Coney Islander visited the Chicago World's Fair and tried to buy George Ferris's 250-foot-tall wheel on the spot. He failed, went home to Coney. At Coney, he opened Sea Lion Park, a ramshackle cluster of attractions featuring a boat ride down a chute the chutes. As soon as he saw it, Tillieu wanted a park of his own. The young men like it because it gives them a chance to hug the girls. The girls like it because it gives them a chance to get hugged. Everybody likes it because it is cheap fun, real fun, lively fun. It realizes its motto, half a mile in half a minute, and fun all the time. The horses were only part of the fun. Dismounting from the steeplechase ride, customers had to cross a small, bright stage ruled by a clown and a dwarf. It was called the Blowhole Theater. It played for almost 70 years, New York's longest running show. As a couple stepped onto the stage, a jet of air blew the woman's skirt up around her waist while the dwarf gleefully shocked her date with an electric cattle prod. The audience shrieked with laughter and waited for the next victim, while the latest ones took their seats in the crowd. Sometimes the manager had to darken the stage and empty the theater so a new audience could push in. Tidu had discovered that customers would pay for the privilege of entertaining other customers. That people liked seeing shows, but they liked seeing people more. He had also discovered that men and women liked almost anything that allowed them to grab hold of each other. The attractions inside Steeplechase soon included the earthquake float, the skating floor, the falling statue, the human cage, the revolving seat, the funny stairway, the eccentric fountain, the dancing floor, the electric seat, the human roulette wheel. Time was when the place was shunned by ultra-respectable New Yorkers who went instead to Manhattan Beach. But nowadays, Coney is visited by all classes. Nine months later, the park was open again. This time, Tillieu covered everything with a glass and steel shed and called it the Pavilion of Fun. It made steeplechase impervious to the weather. Tillieu's rivals claimed he went to church to pray for rain. At 8 o'clock on the evening of May 16, 1903, the gates opened. About 45,000 men, women, and children strolling along Surf Avenue stopped and rubbed their eyes and stood in wonder and pinched themselves to see if there was not something wrong somewhere. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. Thompson and Dundee had decorated their forest of towers and minarets with 250,000 incandescent lights. It was, one man said, an electric Eden. Here is alchemy. Here in full view of thousands, in tiers of boxes and promenades. The spotted horses, the clowns, the acrobats, jugglers, hoop artists, intellectual elephants, Arabian pyramidists, tumblers, contortionists, disport under the crackling lashes of the ringmaster. You felt you were in the Orient, you felt you were in different parts of the world. And the buildings itself made you feel that you were a great chieftain 
and these were your temples, and you could go in there just for a nickel. You could become a, a chief in yourself. You could be almost anything you wanted. All the fairy tales that you read as a little boy were coming true right here in Luna Park. Its one million electric lights would dazzle Luna into obscurity. It would be another world, a dream world. He called it Dreamland. All through the first winter of Luna's success, tall white towers rose across the street. The most dramatic thing that happened in Coney Island was Dreamland itself. Reynolds built his park on a colossal scale. It was to be a catalog of the future, an inventory of the strange, and a compendium of the century to come. The newest technology, the latest science, the odd, the bizarre, the far-flung, would be at home in Dreamland. The park was spread beneath a 375-foot beacon tower. At night, its imperial searchlight beamed 50 miles out over the Atlantic, disorienting ships on their way into New York Harbor. Beneath it, gondolas drifted through the canals of Venice. Trains carried patrons through the Swiss Alps, where they would cool by blasts of refrigerated mountain air. There was a train of the future, The wreck-proof leapfrog railway allowed two trains to pass each other without mishap on the same track. Human beings from every part of the globe were brought to Dreamland and put on display. The park manager, Sam Gumperts, acquired a dozen Somali warriors from French Equatorial Africa and an entire village of Eskimos. In 1905, he hustled 51 Igorot tribesmen from the Philippines past startled immigration officials. Gumperts himself recruited all the citizens of Lilliputia, a half-scale European village, which served as year-round home to 300 midgets. At creation, Visitors journeyed backward through 60 centuries of biblical history to the divine origin of all things. Next door, vast panoramic exhibits foreshadowed the end of the world and hell. Here is a young girl who has bought herself a new hat and is contentedly admiring herself in the mirror. A couple of small and apparently very hungry devils steal up to her from behind and seize her by the arm. She cries out, but too late. The devils lay her in a long, smooth chute. Tongues of red paper flame rise up, and down the chute into the pit slides the girl, the mirror, and the hat. For a public fascinated with horrors closer to home, there was fire and flames, a gigantic stage disaster, where scores of firemen battled the flames engulfing a block of asbestos-covered tenement buildings, twice a day. The infant incubator forms one of the most interesting and thoroughly scientific features of Dreamland. 
Think of a family of incubated children, each baby in its own castle, and each receiving royal care. These delicate, frail, tiny cherubs are not yet ready to begin the struggle for existence. The most popular exhibit at Dreamland was the Infant Incubator. 600 veterans of the Boer War, fresh from Johannesburg, refought their battles in a 12,000-seat stadium. Galveston disappeared beneath the flood. Mount Pele erupted hourly. While across the street, Mount Vesuvius showered death on the people of Pompeii. Crowds surged through the dance halls and restaurants and saloons along the Bowery. 450 motion pictures ran simultaneously, night and day. Many of the shows featured the spectacles of Coney itself. Thompson and Dundee's Naval Spectatorium in Luna Park, where for 25 cents you could see a show that had in its entirety the navies of the world, Japan, Portugal, Germany, coming in and shelling Manhattan and Admiral Dewey's fleet steaming out and sinking every one of them. May 27, 1911, was opening day of the season. At 2 o'clock in the morning, workmen were still busy at Hellgate in Dreamland when the circuitry started acting up. Light bulbs burst. Someone knocked over a bucket of hot tar and it caught fire. In minutes, Hellgate was ablaze. Nearby fire companies got there right away, but everything was lath and plaster, wood and tar and paint. Half an hour after the first alarm, the Dreamland Tower was a column of fire, so tall and bright it could be seen in Manhattan. Animals from Vostok Circus ran panicked and burning out onto Surf Avenue. At three o'clock, the Dreamland Tower collapsed. L.A. Thompson's Old Scenic Railway disappeared, and the Great Whirlwind Coaster. And finally, the old Centennial Observation Tower itself shuddered and fell. 33 fire companies had gotten to the scene, but it was a change in the wind that saved what was left of Coney. At dawn, the firemen packed up and went home. It would have been a perfect opening day, warm, still, and cloudless. Fred Thompson found Dreamland's manager, Sam Gumpert's, staring at acres of smoking rubble and wordlessly shook his hand. All that was left of Dreamland was the pretty waltz that had been written to celebrate its opening just seven seasons earlier. Dreamland came very close on the burning of the world. It took people a while to realize that they hadn't just lost a park, that something had changed, that Coney wasn't going to go forward, all was getting grander. The country had changed, the world had changed. We'd been in an international war, we were an international power, we were an entirely industrialized society. The wonderful magnet that Coney had been simply wasn't needed any longer. Now, Coney did not get smaller. Coney got bigger and more populated. The subway lines got there. You get 300,000 people on a great day in 1913. You'd get a million on a great day in 1923. It was a different place. It was no longer Coney Island. 
in the way that Coney Island fell on the ear of the whole world and represented something unique and entirely new. Amusement shacks are running full blast. The shelves full of chinaware and dolls stuffed with straw and alarm clocks and spittoons. Over it all, in a muffled roar, comes the steady hiss and boom of the breakers. Behind the pasteboard street front, the breakers are plowing up the night with luminous argent teeth. In the oceanic night, steeplechase looks like a wintry beard. Everything is sliding and crumbling. Everything glitters, dotters, teeters, titters. Everything is a lie, a fake, pasteboard. Everything is made of nuts and bolts. The monarch of the mind is a monkey wrench. Sovereign, pasteboard, power. Henry Miller. In the end, the world of Coney Island ushered in overtook it. The towers of Luna Park were just as tall and just as bright. But Manhattan's grew taller and eventually outshone them. Coney's mechanical diversions were being superseded by the automobile. Immigrant parents who had saved up all year to spend one day at Coney grew old. Many of their children prospered and moved to the suburbs. In 1944, fire struck the island again, ripping through Luna Park and gutting all but a few rides. The park limped on for a couple of seasons, then closed forever in 1946. Of the great parks, only steeplechase kept going. On through the 40s, on through the 50s, and into the 60s. On the night of September 20, 1964, while Old Lang Syne, and there's no business like show business, played out over the public address system, a bell chimed once for each of the 67 years Steeplechase Park had been in business. The lights went off tier by tier, blazed out one last time. Then Steeplechase went dark. Meanwhile, on the West Coast and car culture of Los Angeles in the early 1950s. 